Good morning, Hilts family. I'm Brad Phillips. I'm here with Puppy Steps Training, and we're going to be doing Shelby's demonstration for you today. Very excited to send her to you. I'm sure you're excited to get her home. Uh, she's really a sweetheart, and if you know anything uh, about the breed, she's exactly that. So I'm sure you're going to be happy with her. And I hope you're ready for some energy, because she's definitely got that. Uh, first thing in the morning, we definitely like to get her out and get her running just to burn some of that off. Uh, she is going to need quite a bit of exercise as well. She's just one of those breeds that do. But uh, anyhow, we are going to go through the whole demonstration here. We'll uh, start with socialization, then we'll get her out and we'll do the manners, the obedience commands, house training, and leash training. Uh, before we do get her out, just a couple things that I do like to remind everyone. Uh, first, that she is a puppy, and so there's definitely going to be uh, some some periods of growing and maturing where she's going to try and test the water, she's going to see how you react and it's important when those situations arise that you remember that consistency is a key and that's really the key to all dog training and so you need to make sure that you're consistent on giving that feedback whether it be that she needs a reward which rewards we use are food, toys and compassion or whether she needs a correction and for a correction we use the word no or nope uh, and we adjust that correction just based on the action that she just performed. If she breaks a tail, just tell her no and I'll have her do it again. Whereas if she were to jump on me or try and steal food, I'm going to adjust my body language and my voice fluctuation and give her a real firm no. Uh, and occasionally that is correct, uh, accompanied with a leash correction. That's the only type of physical correction that we use. And what that is is just two pops on the leash. You're not trying to jerk her over or pull her backwards, but it's just two quick pops on the leash, just making your presence known and accompanying it with the right correction. Uh, so, yeah, you'll also, during this demonstration, you will hear me use the word okay quite a bit. Of course, that is our marker and, re and our release word. And so it does mark the correct behavior and lets her know that a reward is coming, as well as it releases her from a stay. So, um, also just one thing that I do like to cover right here is just talk just a little bit about the transition period. Uh, I'll talk about it frequently throughout this demonstration, just different times that you really need to be aware. Um, that transition usually lasts between two and four weeks. During that time, uh, they're a little bit stressed out, it's a new environment, they're around new people. And so you really need to make sure that you build a relationship with her and earn that trust and make sure that that leadership position that she knows with me and my other trainers transitions over to you. And so also during that time, uh, like I said, stress and stress often causes them to have to go to the bathroom more frequently, also can cause them to get a loose stool. And so during the house training, I'm gonna tell you a few things about the transition, just how to deal with it and how to make sure that you stay ahead of that P schedule and uh, that way she won't have any accidents in your house or uh, and that you can transition the bell over a little bit more easily. So uh, with that we'll talk about our socialization and we'll kind of get right into the program. So socialization is definitely the most important thing to me and that's making sure that I expose her to a whole variety of new experiences whether it be new people, new sounds, um, animals, car rides, just anything new that can be uncomfortable, I like to do that in somewhat of a controlled environment. That way I can control um, whether she's going to have some severe anxiety or timid or aggressive behaviors attached to any of those uh, different experiences. And so we really focus on that quite a bit. Um, we work on it every day trying to add new variables in with the training and she's done really well she's a very well-rounded puppy and I think you're gonna be happy with her but it's just important that as she comes into your home uh, that you slowly introduce her into some of those new new things around if you see her tail duck and she seems a little bit nervous just go down comfort her uh, ease her in make sure that you don't push her on anything so that she doesn't become really stressed out or develop any any of those negative behaviors like anxiety or timidness towards uh, a certain object or a certain part of your daily routine. Um, so with that, I'll get her out now and we'll start in with our manners. 
So the first manner we're going to talk about is her gates and her doorways. So anytime she comes out of the crate, she goes through the house door, she goes through a gate in the backyard, I expect her to hold a stay. Now this should be an automatic behavior. Um, shouldn't have to tell her anything. Now if she does try and break, I'd simply shut the door. I might lift my leg up and block her. Uh, if she managed to get out, I'd have her go back in and do it again. But it's in, it wouldn't be unless she was really persistent on pushing her way out that I would actually tell her to stay. So, um, now we're going to get her out. Okay, good girl. Good girl. Um, now I'll show you the house door a little bit later on when, uh, when we go outside. Now the one exception to the crate, if she goes in on her own, um, you don't have to release her every time because you will, sometimes she'll go in there out of stress or she's just trying to guess what you want her to do. And so if I don't tell her to go in, I'm not going to have to release her every time, so I don't care if she runs out. But it does kind of look like she's waiting for me. Okay, good girl. Now, um, her next manner is actually what she did when I put on the leash, but anytime I call her over, come here. Come here. before I give her any attention, I expect her to sit. This is what we consider her greeting. And so once she's sitting, then I'll go down and I'll pet her, I'll love on her. Um, but the reason that's important is one, it gets her from not, or it gets her to be planted. She's not going to be jumping on you. Uh, she's not going to be wrapping you up with a leash, anything like that. And jumping is one of those behaviors that is huge for a puppy. They just want to jump. And so by expecting that greeting is huge with the jumping deal. The other thing that it does is it gets her eye contact. When she sits down, she immediately looks up at me. And so by doing so, um, I know that I have her attention. She's going to be focused on me. Oh, that's a good girl. So next I'll show you is her mealtime manners. And so anytime I feed her, which I'll bring her back over here so you can see, sit. I expect her to hold a sit stay. And so I'm going to tell her, stay. Now during her mealtime, food is such a driving force for a dog that I like to really work on her stays. And so we add what we call the three D's, and that's distance, duration, and distraction. Of course, talking is a huge distraction. Um, of course, the duration being the time and distance. You can move the food bowl, you can walk away from her, things of that sort. Okay, good girl. Now, usually I do like to use a slow feeding bowl with her just to slow her down because she swallows it so fast. But I also like to just stick my hands down in her food bowl. Um, just making sure that she doesn't have any food aggression towards me. Cool. As well as you can kind of slow her down that way as well. If she eats too fast, sometimes she kind of chokes on it. And so I want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, but just for the sake of this, I wanted to show you. As well as just me handling her. I'll let her finish up here. Now the other thing that I like to do that's similar, not necessarily during her meal, oh, there's nothing there, is I like to make sure that I just handle her, whether it be her paws, her ears, let me show you that again, um, her tail, just any part that could be sensitive that she might get aggressive over. I want to make sure that there is no aggression attached. Oh, that's a good girl. That's a good girl. Good girl. Now the one time, sometimes aggression can be mistaken, is with children. Children are like the greatest thing to a dog. They run, they squeal, makes things a lot of fun. Your puppy wants to play along, they end up grabbing a pant leg or an arm. And I just want to make sure that never happens. And that way nobody ever mistakes your dog playing as an aggressive behavior. So I make a rule that anytime little kids play with my dog, they have to have a soft toy. And that way it gives her something that she can go after, as well as if the kids get scared, they can throw the baby. And 
she loves to play, and she's already doing really well with fetch. Good girl, drop it. Good girl, good girl. And like I said, she has a lot of energy, a little ball of fire. We actually went for a really long walk this morning, but she's still got quite a bit of energy in her. Huh? Good girl, here. Drop it. Now, seeing how I have the toy out, we'll just talk about drop it for a minute. Um, usually in our manners, or I mean our obedience section, but anytime I ask her to drop it, I expect her to give it up. A lot of times she's not just going to willingly spit it onto the floor, but she will give it up every time I ask. And we've really worked a lot on that because she just loves to play fetch. So anytime she has something, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a hold of it and ask her to drop it. And so drop it, good girl. And see, just like that, she'll give it up. You do have to be careful with these soft toys that her teeth don't get caught in it. And that's why I'll never pull it away, because then you could get a tooth stuck, uh, end up pulling it out, end up hurting her. Now, if she ever has something that you don't want her to have, and she doesn't want to give it up, if it's long enough, you can take it on both sides and just hold it really still. And a lot of times it just becomes unappealing to where they'll give it up. If they don't, I can just simply uh, turn my knuckles in. I don't know how well you can see that. But you're just going to pinch their lips against their canines a little bit. Just causing slight discomfort to where she'll just spit it out. Now, um, if she has something and she won't give it up for some reason, what I'll do is I'll just stick my thumb into her mouth and press down on her tongue. And it just, uh, it's like a button. Every dog is just going to open their mouth as wide as they can to get your thumb off of there. Yeah, if you can't tell, she really wants to play right now. Drop it. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Oh, good girl. So I'm going to take it away for a second so we can finish with our manners. Um, so the next one I'll talk about is chewing. Chewing has to happen. It's one of those behaviors every dog just has to do. They're teething, especially at this stage, and for the next couple months they will be, be losing all their baby teeth, cutting molars, and so they have to chew. So I train on a base of avoiding and replacing. If you can avoid giving her free access to toys, to shoes, of course that's the best way from preventing anything from happening. But it's not possible in your house. There's always something she can chew on. And so that's where replacing comes in. So if I came in and I saw her chewing on a pillow or her soft bed, I would tell her no and I would replace it with something of equal texture. So if it's something soft, give her something soft. If she started chewing on a table leg or a chair, I'd give her something like this bully stick, something hard that she can get into. If she's chewing on like the carpet or shoelaces, uh, give her a rope. You know, just try and mac match the texture. Tell her no and replace it. The other part to chewing is going to be boredom. Boredom is the number one cause of all disasters. But there's two sides of it. One, she's bored, and so maybe you're watching a show, reading a book, uh, maybe you're gone. Just she has a downtime where she's just hanging out and she wants something to chew on. And so what I like to do is I'll just give her something if she has that type of time. Give her a bully stick, let her chew on it. As soon as she was done though, I would take it away. As soon as she gets up and leaves, it's gone. Uh, that way there's still some excitement with it, um, but she doesn't have that free access. Because if she has free access to toys and things like that, she's gonna get bored with them and she's gonna go search for something new to chew on. And so I wanna make sure that she just doesn't ever have just unlimited access to her toys. Drop it. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl, huh? What do you think? So the next one we'll talk about is jumping. Um, drop it. Good girl. Now jumping is a huge behavior for puppies to overcome. And so we've spent a lot of time on it. And we've taught her the word off or the command off. And so if she jumps up on me, or if she tried to jump up on the couch, I would just tell her off and expect her to get down. And that would be one of those times if you can get a leash correction in there, uh, that's huge. 
And so if she were to jump up on the couch, I'd grab that leash, give her two taps, and tell her off. Um, now it's important that if she were to run up to me and it looked like she was going to jump, I'm going to step into her. It's important that you never step backwards. As soon as you step backwards, it becomes a game. You're encouraging her to jump. And so I want to avoid that. Instead, I'm going to step into that jump, restrict the space. A lot of times it'll throw timing off to where she won't jump. But then if she does, I'll bring my knee up and I want to catch her right in the chest. Um, and prevent her from getting her paws up on me. And I'll use the command off. Uh, now if she decides that she wants to jump on a member of your family, uh, usually it's the reasoning behind it is kind of that pack mentality. Dogs understand that there's always going to be an alpha or a leader and then you have the rest of the pack and she might think that she's above someone in that ranking order. And so that's going to be the person that she jumps on or she tries to steal food from. And so if that ever happens, uh, you can have that person control the food. That's a quick sign of leadership. The alpha always tells the pack what they can eat and when they can eat. The other thing you can do is you can take her by the leash and start to walk up to that person, have them call her, and as soon as she tries to jump, I'll give her that leash correction, tell her off, and walk the other direction. And do that three or four times or until that she walks up and presents that greeting or sits at their feet. And then as soon as she presents that behavior, reward her, give her lots of loves, um, give her food, you know, make it very positive. Huh. Good girl. As you can see, she also loves to be pet. Good girl. Now, the last manner I want to talk about is uh, her mouth. And so sometimes she will get excited over food and she'll try and rear up and grab the treat before you've quite presented it. And so that's why we've taught her the command gently. And so before I give her a treat, if she's real excited, I'll just tell her gently. And I want her to be very cautious taking it. I should never fill her teeth. Uh, it's also important along with that that I always give her a treat in the palm of my hand. That way if she were to jump up, it's a natural reaction to pull my hand back and close my close my fist. And so I'll present it that way and tell her gently. I will also never give it to her between my thumb and forefinger. That way she's not going to jump up and catch my fingers. Uh, and anyway, anytime you do that you can see that my fingers go right inside her mouth. So. Always in the palm of my hand, tell her gently. Good girl. Um, so that, uh, that concludes our manners, and next we'll talk about our commands. So the first two commands that we're going to talk about are come and watch me. And so those are our most basic commands. We teach those from day one. And so the first one is just to get her attention. Watch me. Okay, good girl. All I'm looking for is her eye contact. And even I can lure her, see if I can lure her head out with the tree. Watch me. Okay, good girl. Just looking for that quick eye contact. I've also started to use her name the same way. Uh, just expecting her to look at me when I use it. Maybe I might have to just throw that in randomly. But the reason for that command, it's kind of your backup command to come is I'm just getting her attention. A lot of times she's going to run back to me when I say it. Um, but you know that if you have her eye contact, you have her focus. And so I'll use that command um, quite a bit. Anytime I can give her a reward, I just want to use it and make sure that there's always a positive association attached to that command. That way it can be as simple as you're in the kitchen cooking, you drop something you don't want her to get. I'll use that command. Watch me. Okay, good girl. Expect her to look up, allow you to grab that, whatever you dropped. Or it can be as important as she's running into traffic, chasing something, and you just need her to stop and look at you. That's why I'll always work on that command, make sure that she knows that anytime I say that, there is a reward. She's just going to whip around and look at me. And it's important, and the reason it's kind of the backup to come is because the come command is the one command that a lot of people will kill. The reason they kill it is... One, they use it uh, too much, they overuse the command, or they use it in kind of an inappropriate timing. They always use it when she's doing something that she really enjoys, um, or she finds rewarding, but isn't so 
good for the owner. Say like it's time to leave the park or uh, she's chasing something and she might be digging. You tell her to come and then you go and lock her up. And so a negative association will be attached to that command. And so there's a couple things that I do to really prevent that. One is I keep a, a rule of thumb to about 10 to 1. So if I'm in the backyard and she's just running around playing, I'll take a handful of treats and I'll call her to me nine, ten times, give her a reward, let her go again. So it's really rewarding. She's still getting to run around and play, but she's also coming back to me getting a treat and going back to playing. I'll do that ten times for the one time that I have to call her to me to come, go inside, and maybe she gets locked up. That way there's nine or ten positives to that one might be negative. The other thing is the overuse. If you're in the house, you don't need to call her to come. If she's only going to be a hand, you know, five feet away, instead I'll come here, something like that, and she's going to come to me. So now I'll show you that command, which there we go. Um, I might have to try and get her away from me. Might be the hard part in here, so I'll have her come up here. And I'll always lead with her name just to get her attention, and then I'll call her to me. Shelby, come! Good girl. And I just expect her, of course, to come to me. Uh, the important thing with that command, if you're going out into a public place, maybe you're going to the dog park or you're going for a hike, um, I'll always keep her on a long leash until I know for a fact she has enough respect for me to come back to me. And so when I do have her on that long leash, I'll still call her to come, give her a treat, let her go again. Still keep things positive, but really work on that command. But I want to make sure that she's going to respond to me. Shelby, come! Good girl. Good girl. Like I said, make sure that, that you keep that command really, really positive and make sure that you only use it um, if you have a reward or um, when it's really, really necessary. Just because that is a very important command and I want to keep that one really pure. Good girl. Good girl. So the next three commands do have hand signals. And so that sit, which is just a scoop over the nose. Down, I'll turn my hand and go down to the ground. And stay is a stop sign. So we do have both a sit and a down stay. And so I'm going to get her up and show you. So sit. And both of those do have a stay. So sit, stay. Okay, good girl, good girl. Sit. Down. Stay. Okay, good girl, good girl. We'll do it again. They don't necessarily have hand signals, but I always put myself in a position where she can read my body language. So, for example, the crate command, I'll just step in. Shelby, crate. I'll just point, uh, step close so she can read my body language, what I'm expecting of her. And then, of course, she's expected to stay until released. Okay, good girl. The next one, very similar in the way that I um, use my body language, is I'll just tell her, Shelby, go to bed. I don't care what position she's in, as long as all four paws are on the bed, and she is expected to stay until released. Okay, good girl. Gently. Good girl. 
So now we are going to talk about her crate training and her house training. Um, I'll show you how to, how to transition the bell. And then we will uh, go outside and do the leash work. So we're going to talk about her crate training. So I spent a lot of time making sure that she's comfortable in the crate. And uh, she's done really well. She'll sleep through the night uh, eight hours without needing a break. As well as we can put her in there for four hour blocks during the day without her needing a break. So uh, usually we put her to bed about 10 o'clock at night and get her out between uh, 6.30 and 7. When we get her out, we take her straight out to the bathroom and then we bring her back in and we feed her. So she's, usually she's fed by about 7.30 in the morning and we give her a cup and a half of food. And then we feed her again at 6 o'clock at night and that way she has four hours um, to really clear out her system before we put her back in the crate. Now she's also good, like I said, for four hours during the day and she shouldn't need a break during that time. Now with this transition period, she often has to go to the bathroom a little bit more frequently. And so if in the middle of the night she starts whining, she might need to go. And so during that time, I would just take her straight out to the bathroom and right back in the crate. Shouldn't last more than a couple days, but it's important that if she does whine in the crate, take her straight out to the bathroom and then right back in. The one exception to that is if you put her in and she immediately starts to whine. That can happen because she just wants to be with you, she's in a new and stressful environment and she just wants to be comforted. It's important though that during that time you don't let her out. If you do, she'll start to figure out that she can whine and get let out of the crate and then you're backsliding and she's just going to whine in the crate because she does want out. Um, so now we'll talk about her house training. and. I will show you how I transition the bell. Now I'm taking the other bells off because as soon as you do this, she's just going to continually ring the bell, which for the next couple days is what you want. You want a lot of repetitions of her seeing the bell, um, understanding that it means to go outside and go to the bathroom, basically that it means everything that it does here at your house. And so the way we start is what we call targeting the bell. And so I'm just going to break up a treat into several small pieces because I don't want to just stuff her full of food. But I'm going to have her um, sit right here next to me. And I'm just going to hold the bell out. And every time she touches it, okay, I'm going to mark it. Okay, good girl. Okay, good girl. Now these bells really don't ring, but the ones that I give you will... And you can kind of decide how loud you want her to ring them. If she barely touches them, I won't reward it. Okay, but if she really hits them, then I will. So once she's um, consistently ringing the bell out of your hand like this, then I'm going to move over to the door. And I'm going to hang them on the door. Come here. Now I'll call her over and I'm just going to stare at the bells. Okay, and every time she hits it. Oh, okay. Once she's doing that really good, I'll switch the wording. Okay, outside. And I'll start emphasizing the word outside. Okay, outside. Okay, outside. So now I'm going to take her out. Okay, outside. Let's go. And we're going to go outside. Of course, expecting her to wait at the door. Okay. Okay, good girl. Now at this point at your house, I would turn around and have her ring the bell two or three more times and go back outside. Probably do that two or three times. Um, now I'm going to take them away because like I said, after you do that, she'll just continue wanting to ring them, which is great at your house because I want the repetitions. Um, when I do take her outside, I give her maybe a minute or two, pace around, say outside every once in a while. When she does go, it's good outside, good girl, lots of loves, give her a treat, make it really positive. Um, I will forewarn you that you have to ignore her when she pees, otherwise she sits there and tries to like make eye contact with you, and she doesn't pee in one spot, she kind of does circles. So, just kind of one of her little personality traits. But, um, like I said, have her ring the bell a couple times, go back out. Once you do that, I would set a timer for 30 minutes. And for the next day or two, I would take her out every 30 minutes. Just making sure that you're staying ahead of that pee schedule. Uh, making sure that she's getting the repetitions of ringing the bell, going outside to the bathroom, coming back in. 
it is important that if she rings the bell, that it's to the bathroom, straight back in. It's never to play. After a day or two, um, start lengthening the bell. Go to 45 minutes for a couple hours, then go to an hour, up to two hours. Two hours is our standard that she should be good in the house without needing a break. And I know that she can do a lot longer than that. But for the next two weeks, at least, I would not let her go longer than two hours um, inside without having a break. The other thing is you start to lengthen that time period inside between timers. I would also start lengthening yourself from the bell so that you're not walking her up to the bell every time. Instead, if, you know, if it's in the kitchen, the back door that you're going to be using, start just stepping away five to ten feet and just staring at the bell. And she uh, has so much drive that she, it's going to bother her that you're not paying her attention to where she'll just start trying to figure out what you want and she'll go over and ring it on her own. And um, that's great. That's what you want. You want her just starting to figure it out herself. Uh, she's smart enough. I don't think you'll have any issues. But if you do or if you have any questions, don't hesitate to give me a call. A um, couple other things with the house training. One, I do like to leave a short leash attached. That way, if you do need to just grab her, you can grab that leash and run outside. Um, now, if she does have an accident in your house and you don't see her, there's nothing you can do about it. And so that's why I can't stress enough that you need to give her 100% supervision for the next month. If you can't give her that supervision, put her in the crate. Use it as an asset. She'll be fine in there. But you really have to keep an eye on her at all times when she's out. Uh, I've known people that have tethered their dog to them just so they're everywhere that they are so that they're never out of sight. Other people have blocked off part of their house. And just for the next couple weeks is so you don't have her getting lost in a room and having an accident. Now, if you witness her going, it's important that you create a negative experience with it. And so I'll stomp, I'll clap, no, 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 and I'm just going to grab her and run. Um, but a couple things to watch for is if she starts doing circles, starts sniffing really heavily, generally that means she's got to go. Um, or if she just barely wakes up, maybe she's coming out of the crate, just take her straight over to the bell and allow her to ring it and go outside. But really, if you do have any questions, please give me a call. Um, but with that, now we'll just talk about her leash work, and then we'll go outside and I'll show you that leash work. So, um, we take them on two types of walks, and both are going to be very important for a dog of this breed. The first one being an off-leash or a long lead walk. Until I know that she's going to always come back when called to come, uh, then I'm not going to let her off a long lead. But when we go on those walks, I take her out into the woods, into the mountains, to the river, to the lake, somewhere where she can just be a dog. Let her run around, sniff. Um, she sniffs a lot anyway, so it's great just to get her out and let her really use those abilities. Uh, during that time, I like to take a pocket full of treats and I'll call her to me every minute or two. One, it's getting her to stay close. Um, she's checking in as well as you're really working on that come. She gets a treat and then she gets to go run around again. It's really enjoyable to her and it's great for her mental health. Um, these dogs are known to get depressed if they don't get enough exercise. So that's a really important walk just to do at least once a week. Um, it's really important that you do get her on a good walk every single day or at least go and play fetch for an hour out in the yard but get her her exercise. So the second type of walk is our attention walk. Um, I want her by my side with a loose leash, constantly checking in. Now for a pointer, especially, that is an extremely difficult walk to get. And so we've made it to where I think we've done phenomenal with it, but there still is some work to be done. So when we do go on that walk, we have two commands. First is let's go, just signifying we're moving. The second is easy if she starts to pull. Um, when I give her the command easy, I'll give her a quick leash correction and I expect her to either put that slack back in the leash and pay attention to me. So she doesn't really pull real hard, but a lot of times she'll get her nose going in, she'll start to veer away. I'll give her a quick easy, she comes back in, in the line. Um, the other thing is sometimes she'll stop and point and so then getting her to break point um, is another thing that you have to work on. So we'll go outside, I'll show you what we've done and uh, that'll conclude our demonstration.
That's cool. I do like to get her attention before I start a walk, and so I'm going to ask her to sit. Good girl. And then when I start, I'll just tell her, let's go. Her periodically checking in. Let's go. Good girl, good girl, let's go. Now, if she sees the distraction, starts to pull, which we'll see if she will with this cat right here. I'm gonna tell her easy, and I expect her to put the slack back in the leash, just like that. Good girl, good girl. Sit. Down. Oh, good girl. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. We've had a great time uh, training Shelby, and we're excited to send her to you. Thanks.